Okay, so soft tissue tumors. <clears throat> so I'm going to follow kind of along the World Health Organization classification. <clears throat> and this is from an article from 2009. Uh, things have changed a bit since then, but uh, uh, I don't think dramatically. So I, I'm going to basically give this as more of an overview of different soft tissue tumors that you might be seeing when you're looking at the musculoskeletal MR examination. Uh, it goes through the lipid tumors, uh, uh, fibrotic tumors, uh, fibrohistiocytic tumors, smooth muscle, parasitic, skeletal muscle, vascular, chondroosseous, and then of uncertain tissue origin, and then some non-classified lesions down here at the bottom. So with MR, we try to classify lesions based upon, oops, based upon their, uh, let me put something out of the way here, uh, uh, char MR characteristics. And we typically, I like to anyway, evaluate all soft tissue lesions using T1-weighted images, T2-weighted images, and usually proton density fat-suppressed images. And <clears throat> It's very important and when you uh, look at tissue characterization uh, to be a little bit more of a stickler as what T1 and T2 is. And in particular, the uh, proton density and even the T2 fat suppressed images, once you do fat suppression, you really change the uh, characteristics of the lesion. And uh, uh, when I talk about T1 and T2 hypo or hyper intense, I'm really talking about actual T1 and T2 weighted images. The other thing to realize is that the T2 that we use nowadays, using fast spin echo, does have a different tissue characterization than a true T2 weighted image if you use the, uh, the pure T2s like we used in the early days of MR, but they take much longer. Uh, but over time, we've been able to... Uh, you really characterize lesions based upon the T2 because a lot of the big difference between T2 standard and T2 fast spin echo uh, uh, we've been able to, to recognize. So we can look at uh, T1 hypertense lesions, and these typically are lipomatous lesions like lipoma, liposarcoma, hemangioma, myositis ossificans. <clears throat> you can also see hyperintense T1 images and hematomas, if they have met hemoglobin, uh, uh, different kinds of cysts, especially abscesses, and then melanoma is a soft tissue that can also be hyperintense on T1-weighted image, though not as much as fat, uh, uh, because of the MR characteristics of the melanin. And then T2 hypointense typically are scar-forming type tumors, uh, fibromas, giant cell tumors, tendon sheath tumors, lymphoma, uh, calcium containing like gout or calcified uh, lesions, or hemosiderin like in giant cell tumor of the tendon sheath. T2 hyperintense typically are in cysts if you just have uh, liquid, uh, but you can also see hyperintense lesions and myxoid lesions, uh, PNST, and synovial sarcoma that we'll talk about. Uh, and here's just another characterization of uh, lesions. If they're hyperintense on T1, uh, you then look at the fat suppressed images to see whether the hyperintensity is from fat or not from fat. If there's no fat uh, suppression, uh, then you're dealing with something uh, like melanoma, or melanoma metastases, uh, abscesses, hematoma that have their hyper. Uh, signal intensity on T1-weighted images, not from fat. And if they do uh, fat suppress, uh, then uh, then you know that it's fat. And then fat, you've got to determine whether it's going to be malignant or not malignant. Uh, <clears throat> if there are calcifications, uh, then typically you're looking at flebolis, like in hemangiomas, or myositis ossificans. Uh, if there are uh, no uh, calcium within the lesions, uh, then you've got a little bit more uh, varied differential. And then uh, here is just some other papers that have looked at using different MR characteristics. 
uh, to uh, evaluate typically on T1-weighted image. If they're hyperintense, they either have fat-containing tissue, methemoglobin, melanin, or high levels of protein, like in proteinaceous cysts. If you have lesions that are hypo-intense on T2-weighted images, uh, then you ask if there are calcifications. Yes, then you go to galletophi or dystrophic calcifications. No, then you go to a much larger differential diagnosis uh, looking at the tumors that, that we can see here, uh, predominantly fibrous-containing tumors that can either be benign or malignant. Calcifications typically means it's usually a benign-type lesion. Uh, if it's hyperintense on T2-weighted images, <clears throat> Uh, then this is a case where a contrast is helpful. Uh, if it's rim enhancement, uh, the, the center part does not enhance, and you're typically de dealing with some sort of a fluid collection. If you have internal enhancement, then it can be a myxoid tumor like intramuscular, intramuscular myxoma, though not intramuscular myxomas will enhance. So they can look like cysts within the muscles, but just remember, benign cysts within the muscles are really quite rare. Myxoma is rare, but something that looks like a cyst in a muscle is more likely to be myxoma, which is a low-grade malignant lesion, uh, than, than fluid. Fluid gets squished out of muscles. And then you can have myxoid sarcoma, and then uh, you can get synovial sarcomas uh, can fit in this category, PNST that we'll talk about, or, or necrotic tumors that have necrotic fluid within them. And this is just another flow chart. This is from radiographics, basically showing the same thing for cystic appearing lesions. And uh, again, I won't go through all of this. This is basically saying the same thing that I just said. This is just puts it out in more detail. So if you're interested, this is a nice article in radiographics from 2013 uh, that looked at the different signal characteristics in a little bit more detail. Uh, for the different kinds of soft tissue tumors. So, and then if you just want to look at malignant characteristics on MR, uh, other things that have been uh, described in the literature, if the lesion is greater than five centimeters, it makes it more likely to be malignant. Now, in this day and age, we'd like to pick even malignant lesions up uh, when they're much smaller than this. If they have surrounding edema or what looks like inflammatory changes, they're more likely to be malignant. If you're, uh, unless you're dealing with something that's obviously a, an infection type lesion. If they're heterogeneous and T2 signal, that's a uh, characteristic that's most common in malignant lesions. If you have a highly enhancing uh, tumor, so the two things that, uh, that, that means that there's a lot of neovascularity in these. So it can either be acute inflammatory disease or a malignant disease uh, tend to have uh, enhancement in the first uh, minute of uh, injection of the contrast. Though we typically don't use uh, a contrast looking at uh, the, the rate of, of, uh, of uh, enhancement. Uh, uh, it's something that we used back when we were evaluating inflammatory disease a number of years ago, <laughs> but it's a little bit <coughs> Uh, most techs are not trained to do this properly, and most people, uh, they use equilibrium enhancement and not the dynamic enhancement. If it's liquid flaccid, it looks like fluid, but a lot of inhomogeneous signal intensity, it's more likely to be malignant. And if you see a lot of destruction of soft tissue fascial planes, that's more likely to be malignant. So here's a question in this paper in radiology from 2014 of 21 MR characteristics. Paratumoral contrast enhancement alone is predictive of a high-grade sarcoma. So if you see enhancement around the tumor, uh, that is suggestive. If, if it's uh, a solid lesion that doesn't look like you're dealing with an abscess, uh, then that's a uh, uh, highly worrisome finding if you have peritumoral enhancement. That generally means that you have infra, uh, infiltration of the surrounding soft tissues by malignant cells, uh, producing a, an inflammatory reaction from the body against the tumor cells. Now, if we look at superficial masses, 
uh, uh, size typically is not useful, like on the skin. Uh, facial edema is uh, helpful. Skin thickening is can be seen in a lot of factors, but can be seen in malignant uh, infiltration. Uh, skin contact, hem hemorrhage and the lesion is worrisome. Necrosis is worrisome, lobulation. And then again, peritumoral edema, uh, especially if it enhances, is a worrisome sign. And then you can look at the difference between cutaneous and, and subcutaneous. Uh, if, if, you, if you look at these, uh, about uh, a quarter of all of these lesions are going to end up being unclassified sarcomas on uh, biopsy. Uh, about a quarter of wild mouth sarcomas, uh, you know, less than a fifth amount of mouth fibrosarcomas protuberans, angiosarcomas, and mixofibrosarcomas. Subcutaneous, a uh, third are liposarcomas, uh, uh, about a quarter of uh, malignant fibrohistiocytomas, and then a few sarcomas, and then oh, a lot of other tissues. So uh, cutaneous tissues, uh, generally unclassified sarcomas, sarcomas, and then uh, deeper, you're usually talking about liposarcomas and malignant fibrohistiocytoma. Uh, again, peritumal edema, necrosis, and heterogeneous T2 signal is a bad sign. Uh, and uh, uh, especially if you have two or more of the findings, and that's a very worrisome finding. Local staging of soft tissue sarcoma. Uh, if you, sarcomas tend to like to enhance, uh, encase the neurovascular structures, grow around them. And they found that MR is accurate in, in evaluating this. Uh, if the contact exceeds 180 degrees around the neurovascular bundle, then that's a uh, worrisome finding on a soft tissue lesion. Uh, this, this. Okay, so let's go into tumor like lesions. So, uh, Robert, what do you think of this? All right, so we have a young female with a tender dorsal mass. Um, and looking at the wrist, dorsal aspect of the wrist, it looks like there's a fluid signal structure arising uh, posteriorly. And um, yeah, looks like a cyst, but uh, I guess I'd want to see if it enhances maybe. Yeah. Dorsal game. So you can do it. Well, we, we usually don't in, give enhancement on these lesions. And this is a typical dorsal ganglion cyst that you've already, all of you have seen a number of this year. Its location, its signal characteristic of being sharply defined on the PD fat sat images, uniform and increased signal intensity on the fat suppressed images, mostly uniform low signal intensity on the on the T1 weighted images, but really its location, its association with the dorsal capsule of the risk. Now, this is typically considered what people call ganglion cysts, uh, but it's really I think these are synovial cysts coming out of the out of the capsule and. Uh, well, you know, we see them all the time, and to have a cyst that something that looks cystic like this without any of the worrisome findings that we just talked about in this location, it's really a benign lesion. Okay. And these are extremely common, and most times you can treat them with a, uh, with a needle and and some hydrocortisone. Um, I haven't had to remove too many of them, but when you do surgery, you have to remove um, the the vascular feeder to the cyst; otherwise, it comes back. So you have to wide you have to remove a wide um, area of where the cyst arises. But these are very common. As you know. Hey, Dr. Cruz, I think we lost you. We lost somebody. <laughs> Did you hear what I said? I heard you, yes. Well, 
we lost Dr. Cruz. Do you hear him or? Robert? I do not hear him, no. I don't either. I used to use the Bible on these sets in the old days. I thought the Bible was a treating factor. <laughs> I've had a few, I busted them myself, just press on them till they popped. Eventually they don't come back. Maybe, maybe we should give them a call. Looks like he's working, working on it. Yeah, I suppose. There's now. There you are. Okay. Well, we're starting to pick up the sound, John. Sorry about that. I don't know why they did it that time. Okay, so this is this was intermetatarsal bursitis. Okay. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Can you guys hear us? Yes. Can you, no, can, you can you leave that for a second? Let's see. I don't know. I, no. Every time I see the power cut off <laughs> the microphone, it happens. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. Okay. No Eliora. All right. We have a 49 year old female with hip pain. We got a T1 fat set, post arthrogram. Uh, fluid in the joint, there's some fluid along, you know, anteriorly in the region of the iliopsoas bursa. Okay. Maybe it was a uh, bursal injection of contrast, maybe? Well, it was a joint injection, but it, the joint often communicates with the iliopsoas bursa. Mm. So the bursa feels it may have a little loose body there. And this just shows you, if you have fluid collections, in locations that are classic for known anatomic structures, that's another time when you can be very confident if you have a nice fluid collection, sharp margins, in this case, what looks like an obvious loose body and not tumor in it. Uh, this is uh, clearly uh, fluid extending into the iliopsoas bursa, and we're dealing with a benign lesion. So we'll just go through a couple of common locations or we see bursal fluid collections uh, that should be recognized and as such. Robert? All right. Uh, here, looking at the knee, uh, there's a joint effusion and then some fluid in the infrapatellar bursa. Don't see a whole lot else. Right. And so here we have typical fluid in the infrapatellar bursa. This is a little bursa down here. Usually it's very thin. Most of the time you can see a little bit of thin fluid in this. These uh, almost always communicate with the joint space, so they tend to be larger when you have a large effusion and smaller when you, when you don't have an effusion. 
So that's an infrapatella bursa. Okay. All right. So looks like we have a multilocular cystic lesion there where the you know, insertion of the medial head gastrocnemius is. Right. This is kind of just a nonspecific ganglion cyst. Right. So this is a this is another typical location where we'll commonly see uh, multilocular cysts, probably due to uh, very commonly associated partial tears of the origin of the uh, <clears throat> gastrocnemius uh, tendons. And these typically are multilocular often, and you tend to get a lot of get a lot of these fibrous structures in it. So it can be very inhomogeneous, but the margins are very sharp. Internally, the margins between fluid and the fibrous tissue is very sharp. So these are fibrous septa, not really tumors. And again, you commonly see this, uh, <clears throat> and uh, we almost always pass these off as just uh, uh, benign. Most people call them ganglion cysts, so I don't know what the term ganglion means in that situation. But anyway, <clears throat> though, I will show you a lesion that looks like this that's malignant later on in the lecture. Uh, but it has characteristics that should tip you off that it's not benign. So you can see malignant lesions in this location, but if you follow the kind of the guidelines that we've talked about previously, you should be able to differentiate them from the common benign cyst. Okay, 52-year-old male, abrupt left hip contracture. Mm, looks like, <laughs> is that a tendon that's torn there? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to call it. Do you even know where we are? <laughs> how's, how's an MR? Is that helpful? Oh, yes. Uh, right, so in the region of the iliacus, there's... So, yeah, intramuscular lesion. Okay, so these are T1 weighted images. What do we look for in T1 weighted images? T1, uh, yeah, so mostly T1 bright. Uh, okay. could be... So it's somewhat inhomogeneous, but there, there's a lot of bright signal within, the, within this. So there mm -hmm. are components in this that have a short T1 time. Yeah. So now look at the morphology of the bright areas, what do you think they are? Um, I'm not sure. So sure it you... doesn't look like the morphology of a typical lipoma, right? Correct. That's had more uniform, high signal intensity, uh, sharp margins. This is more infiltrated. I mean, this is more diffuse, mm -hmm. indistinct margins on some of this. There are a lot of linear areas that we see here so that could be a little bit worrisome. Let's look at some other images. Here are T2-weighted images. Can this be helpful? Sure. Uh, we see it's it's heterogeneous as well, but there's some regions of, looks like fluid. Okay. Um, let's see. So how would you differential be? This is kind of an inhomogeneous mass. Mm -hmm. So well, what's your differential? Well, it's, it seems like it's something acute, so I would think uh, maybe hematoma, intramuscular okay, hematoma. Yeah. So, so good, and that's what this is. This is intramuscular hematoma, though uh, I certainly would be worried about this lesion if I didn't have the history that the patient had a valve replacement when I was on Coumadin. And if, if in this particular case, uh, let me get back here. Yeah, this, this was abrupt symptoms, as you talked about, which is much more likely to be a hematoma rather than a tumor that's grown to this size, right. uh, which is not abrupt. So good. So, and this was this is a typical kind of appearance of a, of a relatively acute uh, hematoma where you have different areas of uh, oxidative uh, denaturization or of, the, uh, of the hemoglobin, breaking down of the hemoglobin content. Would you still follow this one until it resolves? Yeah, uh, yes, in this particular case, 
they probably would want to res uh, see it resolved because the patient is on Coumadin and you want to make sure that there's not a whole lot you can do except wait and see on these. Uh, uh, so they would probably clinically want, want to follow it, though I'm, I'd be pretty comfortable with that history that this is an intramuscular hematoma and I would, I would want to see it kind of go down in size. But, but I, I believe this, uh, most of these in the United States anyway would be followed to make sure that they're resolving. Okay. Well, it doesn't look like a tumor, so I mean a fracture. So yeah, I agree. It, it doesn't look like a fracture, and it, but. And it's sudden, so um, you'd have to lean towards some kind of a, and that occurs real rapidly. and. And a malignancy don't do that. So, uh, I mean, I I'd call a radiologist for that. Okay, I think we lost you guys, or you lost us again. Can you can you talk? Let's see if we got you back. We can hear you. Oh, good. We can hear you too. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Robert. Yeah, I think I'm up. Uh, so it looks like there's a big patellar and subcutaneous soft tissue. Sit over here. So we stop moving it. Hey, uh, yeah. We're running It's out. So we're going to try to keep the microphone stable. Can you guys hear us? Yes. Yes. Can you hear us? I can. <laughs> can you guys hear us now? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay, uh, Robert? All right. Looking at the knee and the subcutaneous soft tissues, there's a fluid collection with fluid fluid levels. I'd be concerned about a hematoma and a morale level A lesion. Uh -huh. You're a good reader. <laughs> good. Okay. And we've talked about these before. Jason? All right. So, looks like a lot of uh, synovial thickening inside of this uh, shoulder effusion. Maybe with some erosions as well in the hemo head. Um, yeah, there's a lot of irregularity inside of that capsule. Not hearing it, though, Ben. Some sort of inflammatory arthropathy. Makes okay, me let me just give you some history. The patient has renal failure okay. and diabetes. So is this and like it's a... involving? It's involving joints bilaterally and relatively symmetrically. So is this like um, amyloid? Good. Yeah, this is amyloid. So if we look back here, these are all kind of, this is a fat suppressed image over here. And then uh, over here, a T1 weighted image, but low signal intensity really on all sequences, uh, which is kind of what amyloid looks like. So with amyloid, you tend to get bilateral involvement, extensive thickening, which can become massive like that, uh, and you can get periarticular erosions and bony involvement with the amyloid. Uh, does uh, amyloid have a particular um, T1 or T2? Yeah, it, it tends to have long T1 and short T2. That's why it's dark on both. Can you explain that in English instead of mathematics? <laughs> well, yeah, it, it tends to be uh, dark on the T1s and dark, which t it tends to be dark on all sequences, uh, similar, similar to uh, fibrous tissue, but it's not fibrous tissue. The, uh, you get those characteristics because of the, the, the amyloid, uh, the structure of the amyloid molecule. That's better. Thank you, John. Sure. 
All right, so here, sequences of the fingers, we see, is this T1 weighted? Okay, this is right, T1. This is, yeah, this is T, the, the sagittals are T1, the axials are T2, old fashioned T2. And here we go. Okay. Here's a uh, T1 on the left and a PD fat set on the right. Okay, so we have these. Uh, lobular masses, low signal on both you know, the T1 and the T2 uh, fat set. Yeah, it's on the fifth digit. Um, so the characteristics are similar to amyloid. Sure. I'll let you know that this isn't amyloid. But what, what else could have these kind of T1 and PD fat set sequences uh, signal? Mm. Calcifications could that be low signal? Calcifications could. Uh, sometimes, often with calcification, you'll get a little bit more susceptibility type artifact with the little bright and uh, black areas around them here. Mm -hmm. uh, so it could be any sort of fibrous lesion. Mm -hmm. And in this particular case, uh, this was dermatomyositis, okay. which chronic lesions can uh, get filled in with fibrous tissue, and, and those particular lesions. Okay. Robert. Oh boy. Let's see. I was looking at the wrist and then along the radio oh, sorry, owner aspect. It looks like there's a soft tissue mass that's low signal. Some kind of heterogeneous. There's also yeah, additional mass like lesions kind of throughout the carpal bones. Uh, again, looking at the axials, there's a lot of low signal heterogeneous foci kind of threw it out. Yeah, not, not entirely sure what this is, to be honest. Okay, so this is scleroderma. Again, both dermatomyositis and scleroderma uh, in their chronic long-standing phases can become very fibrous and end up with these uh, low signal lesions. You'd like to get see a plain film to see if this is calcium, see if it's calcified, uh, in which case it's you can generally not get calcification. Certainly, uh, you wouldn't, uh, with these two lesions, you wouldn't expect uh, all of this to be calcification. Most of this is going to be a fibrous re replacement. So there are a list of kind of benign appearing uh, low T2 signal masses <clears throat> in the musculoskeletal system. You can think hematoma, pigmented villanodular synovitis, fibromas, Sclerosing perineuroma, scleroderma, and uh, dermatomyositis is the typical ones to, to think about. All right, 81 year old female, right, posterior thigh mass rule out neurogenic tumor. All right, so this uh, looks like a pretty superficial mass with. Acoustic shadowing and internal vascularity. Okay, I'm uh, sure you see this every day. This is nodular hydranoma. Uh, but, uh, hydranomas uh, uh, tend to have, they're very uncommon. <clears throat> uh, but I, rare. <clears throat> and they, there are several different varieties. Uh, they're often solitary. They can be massive in size sometimes and uh, can be discolored. AMR findings, they tend to be mixed solid and cystic massive with fluid levels within them and variable signal intensity with T1 and T2s. Uh, cystic components. <laughs> uh, and here's uh, typically what they look like on an MR examination. They're often protruding uh, nodules like this. Okay, so let's go to the uh, adipose tissue com containing uh, tumors. Let's start with the benign ones. There's lipoma, lipoblastoma, angiolipoma, myolipoma, chondroid lipoma, spindle cell pleomorphic <laughs> lipoma, lipomatosis of nerve, lip lipomatosis, and hibernoma. Uh, I'll just uh, name a bunch of them. A lot more lesions than, than what there were when I was a student. 
So, uh, and the lipid containing tumors that are not benign are typically the liposarcomas. They can, they're typically, but there are a lot of different systems. One is intermediate and uh, definitely malignant. Uh, uh, so the, you can give the atypical lipomatous tumors, uh, which can be locally aggressive but don't metastasize, and then the metastatic tumors. And we'll talk about when to feel confident and when not to feel confident about diagnosing the benign variety. This is a, an old study from the very early days. Let's see. Okay, go for it. Uh, this, yeah. is, this is a T1-weighted image. T1 bright uh, le intramuscular lesion. Okay. Uh, yeah, pretty homogeneous. T1 bright, T2 and, and bright as well. This was uh, right after we first got a stir sequence. I think this was when I was in Santa Barbara. Oh, God, I'm blocking out the name of the guy who invented stir. Not terrible in it, but okay. Anyway, um, so you can see on the stir that it uh, that it's lipid, mm -hmm. uniformly lipid, uniformly decreases in size, and this was a benign lipoma. Uh, and you can get these little streaky things here, which are typically the uh, neurovascular uh, bundles within the, the tumor. Uh, and I think we'll I'll see some papers later on talking about the size of nodules and uh, above which uh, how large they could be. But the bottom line is. Is little linear structures that are less than two to three millimeters in thickness without any actual nodular masses within the, the lipoma, uh, you can be very confident that you're dealing with a benign lesion. If you s see anything beyond that, then it's a potentially liposarcoma. Though, in my, in my experience, most of the time that I've been concerned about it and they removed the lesions, Unless it's a really a bad-looking lesion, they turn out to be benign. Uh, <clears throat> so, but, uh, we'll see both benign and malignant here. Okay, uh, Robert. All right, so we have a 36-year-old with a palpable mass, left thigh for a year, and pain for two months. All right, looking at the posterior compartment of the leg, there's a you know, fat signal mass. T1 weighted imaging, and there's a little bit of associated edema on the T2, and inferiorly it looks like there's some septations or fluid. So this is a T. This isn't really a. T, okay, this is really a T2 fat suppressed image, so that's not mm -hmm. right. And there's a big difference between a T2 weighted images and a T2 fat suppressed image when it comes to tissue characterization. But you can see the fat is suppressed here, mm -hmm. uh, but. Uh, well, what you see here are all the stranding uh, within the lesion on both the uh, T1 and the T2 fat suppressed sequence with some kind of bright areas. So this I would put in the category of not clearly benign, and anything that's not clearly benign is potentially malignant. Uh, uh, but I don't see any nodular masses, uh, so this I wouldn't be very worried about. And... Uh, and we can see, again, it's very streaky, so you can't call it a benign lesion. Uh, and, but when they removed this, this was all benign. The, the other thing that you can think about that would, in a situation like this would be a brown tumor, which is a benign a lipoma of uh, brown fat, which we'll talk about. And we've had a few of these here, and they've all come back benign, but again, with this much inhomogeneous signal, I, I, I wouldn't call it straight benign. Okay. Um, brown tumors can be a, a, a somewhat malignant, can they, John? Uh, we're going to talk about them a little bit later. You know, it's funny. I've never heard of a malignant brown tumor, but I'm sure that's possible, John. I'm sure it's possible. Okay. Who's next? Uh, it's me. Okay. All right. Chronic wrist pain. I might and have to yell into the mic here. All right. Um, 
I guess where I expect the median nerve to be, it looks markedly enlarged with a lot of intervening fat so, septa. So we can see a little bit of high signal on the T1, mostly high signal on the PD fat set right there. And if we go into the carpal tunnel itself, what do you see here? Uh, I think, yeah, this median nerve is still quite enlarged there. Right. And then if we go distal to this, into the hand, this is what it looks like. So a lot of fat separating the uh, flexor yeah. tendons of yeah. the medium. Basically, you have no muscle. Yeah. Right? Okay. The patient was extremely weak and really did not have a functional hand. So what do you think this is? Um, if you notice over here, there's something over here, too. It's... Uh, the hematoma. Yeah, and if you notice this, this is an abnormal nerve here. This turned out to be a fibrolipoma. These were fibrolipomatous hematomas. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but, but we'll talk about some other nerve lesions that cause thickening of the nerves uh, that I'd be concerned about with this as well. But this obviously had uh, neuro neurologic loss distal to these hematomas. Uh, tell you are. 40 year old female, mass right inguinal area. <clears throat> mm. Yeah, radiograph. Looking in the right inguinal, not seeing too much. Oh, that? Okay. Yep. Substitution <laughs> mass. Yeah, on the, uh, so we have the T1. Weighted image above and bottom left. Looks like fat signal within the muscle or surrounding muscle. It suppresses with fat suppression, so it is fat. Yeah. But then we have these kind of thickening areas within it, mm -hmm. which again, the way I like to look at this, it's not clearly benign once you have these, but it's highly, highly likely to be benign but I wouldn't call it a benign lipoma. I'd at least follow it. Uh, most of these people elected to remove them. This bothers me a lot more. Uh, and this is the same person, uh, same lesion in the axial plane. So that that uh, I'm much more concerned about as being potentially malignant. Here's the tumor excised. Uh, there, this is what the cells look like. And this was a hyper, hibernoma fat cells, uh, which tend to have a lot more signal intensity within them than, than the typical uh, 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 non-brown fat tumors. And these can be quite large, uh, And uh, but this was a benign lesion. Okay, uh, Robert. All right, so here we have a knee and it looks like there's a you know large joint effusion with a lot of synovial thickening on here on the sagittal. It looks like some of that synovial thickening actually looks fat signal. Right. So what do you think this is? It's kind of looks like a lipoma arborescence to me. Right. And again, this is an ant many uh, typical findings, uh, probably due to chronic long-standing synovitis with a lot of fat deposited in the, in the synovium, uh, again, a benign lesion. Jason? All right, varicose black on the left lateral thigh, 30 years. Recently increased in size. Uh, yeah, it looks like a tuberance there, lateral thigh. It looks like it's mostly Fat density. Uh, a lot of skin thickening. Yeah. yeah, the skin thickening would would worry me. Yeah, a fair amount. And this is called uh, nevus lipomatosis superficialis. And histologically, these are all mature fat cells. Uh, within it, and it's considered a malformation of the tissues. Uh, 
Sometimes it was a different lesion, I think. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. So ultrasound. Hi, I'm in lecture. Right, ultrasound. We see uh, this this uh, hypocoke lesion, well circumscribed. Not much through transmission. No, not a lot of Doppler not, signal. No vessels. No. no. Yeah. There's the okay, so, tuberosity. There's the MR. Right. Looks or the yeah, CT looks mostly CD. yeah fluid. The ischial region, maybe it's low in density. Here's the MR. MR, this is a T2. This is a T1. T1. It's T1 bright, uh, but not, doesn't look like fat. Yeah, it looks like some little septa in it. Mm. Okay, here's the T2. Okay. So heterogeneous with these kind of thick internal septa. Yeah. And here's the PD facet. Uh, yeah, I don't think there was any, doesn't seem like there's any fat in there. I, I, sorry, I kind of forgot what that looked like previously, but. Yeah. Not a no. major suppression. And here's what that looked like when they removed it. And this was a dermoid cyst. Okay. Okay. Uh, Robert? Yeah, so we have a 54-year-old with a right thigh growing mass for seven to eight years, rubbery, hard, and non-tender. Uh, starting with the plain films, it looks like there is some ovoid density overlying the you know, the femur there. Ultrasound, it looks hypo-intense, pretty homogeneous. Um, and then on the MR, it's again multilobulated, uh, a little heterogeneous intermediate signal with some high signal foci internally. Yeah, similar here looks multilobulated. Uh, yeah. So, so again, this isn't a standard uh, like uh, li benign lipoma. Has a lot of kind of inhomogeneous signal intensity within it. Uh, so we can't. Uh, and this was removed. And this was a soft tissue xanthoma. Uh, let's see. Okay, uh, Tayson. All right, four year old female uh, of a mass, I think, within the muscle of the posterior thigh. Uh, low on T1 and high on T2 fat suppress. Uh, we have some pretty avid enhancement. Uh, yeah, but again, be careful about the enhancement if you don't have yeah. a similar pre. It's very easy to get fooled. This is probable enhancement, but without a T1 fat sat pre, uh, you'd be very careful about uh, stating it definitively. Okay. Uh, and though you, we don't see a lot of, we don't really see classic fat yeah. on the T1 coronal, but that's pretty characteristic of this lesion. And this is a myxoid liposarcoma. And uh, most l the liposarcomas that I've seen over the years don't have detectable fat in them. If you do fat suppression, you'll see a decrease in the signal, but uh, most of them will not have bright fat on the T1 weighted images. Okay. Uh, the ones that do are probably lipomas that have focal areas of sarcomatous degeneration within them. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, th this is pretty typical. So most liposarcomas are going to look like malignant soft tissue masses. Okay. And the, the lipid part is seen histologically on the slides. Okay, 47-year-old okay, physician with buttock mass. Um, yes, yeah, so we have T1 on the left, uh, T2 fat suppressed on the right. Well, I believe this is going to be one that we're going to show 
a number of different images on. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the, and the, there's a point I want to make here. So this is a T1 and a PD fat set. This is on 7501. We see this large mass here. There it is on the axial images. Looks like it uh, has fat in it. Again, not completely benign because we can see that we have areas here of abnormal signal intensity that's more than two millimeters in thickness uh, here, but it still looks mostly like a, a lipoma. But again, this is one that I would be worried about and not call benign. Uh, now we've got a bunch of sequences here. Uh, T1, PD fat set, T1, I think this is a T2 fat set on 7501. Uh, and this is probably a uh, P, uh, TR, uh, so a PD fat set here. Okay, so this was then biopsied, and it showed a low-grade liposarcoma. So they then uh, removed it, and uh, this is. Uh, of, I think, a few weeks after the uh, surgery. Hmm. Uh, on the T1 on the left, we see some, I see a little, like, focus of bright signal. Could that be some remnant fat, maybe? Yeah, it could be. I'd be worried about that, but also it could be remnants of blood. Yeah. It could be. Uh, yeah. So, you know, postoperatively, this would be nonspecific. Uh, in this area, probably just post-operative change. Okay, so yeah, so this is seven thirteen oh one. We start out seven five oh one, so that's right after surgery. So that's probably some blood products after surgery, I would guess. Okay, and on the axial images, uh, again, I would be concerned uh, that this is probably blood products, but this is looks so. Here, it looks like it kind of gets bright here, but it's hard to kind of mix it up. Now, I don't know if you notice or not that the, we have a axial T1. The axial T2 is actually a different sequence this time. So the point I want to make, every time this patient was scanned, they used a completely different technique. And going through all the different studies, uh, there was no single technique in the same plane throughout the entire study. So every time they came back, it was a hodgepodge of different sequences and different planes. So anyway, this was thought to be post-operative at this particular time. But uh, kind of watch these two areas as we go forward. So now this is 72701. <clears throat> uh, and what do you think here? Uh, so PD fat set on the left. See that they had no or they had no T1. In the coronal plane, uh, so this is this is a, I think a yeah PD. F no, I'm sorry. This is a T1 fat suppressed. Okay. They had no non-fat suppressed at, at, at this one, and this is a PD fat suppressed sequence over here. Okay. Well, it doesn't look like scar tissue post op, so I I would worry about it. Uh, okay. On MR. All right, I, uh, I think they left some behind. Well, this is pretty close, but okay. All righty. Okay, and then, so this is 72701. They did go back in. They, they were worried like John was, and they actually found malignant tissue that they then re retook out. Uh, and, uh, and then they then started following the patient again. So here's what it looked like, a fat suppressed sequence and this is a T2 fat suppressed in the axial plate on 22502. Mm -hmm. And this was back uh, six months earlier, uh, which is a PD fat suppressed, yeah, PD fat suppressed technique, which is the best we could do to compare the two. And here's what the T1 weighted image looks like now on 72502. Mm -hmm. And if you remember from the prior study, we didn't see all this fat signal here. But I think the thought was, well, maybe this is just the, the soft tissue planes reforming after, after surgery. Uh, 
uh, well, we can see the suppression of the fat along there. Okay, so they continue to follow the patient who happened to be a physician in town here. Uh, and this was now a couple of years later. Right, so that that uh, kind of linear fat between the uh, the muscles, I mean, I'd want to look at that on the axial plane to compare, but maybe it's a little bit bigger. Yeah, so the only axial plane images we had on this okay. one was this one. Oh, no. Yeah. Wait, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, at, at this particular time, we had no T1 non-vet suppressed axial sequences. Yeah. Then the patient came back with a little bit more fullness, and now we're at 2007. Yeah. And now we have now, now a T1 weighted axial sequence again without yeah. fat suppression. So what do you think here? Yeah, when the axial T1 non-fat non suppressed, that, that fat is certainly bigger. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, this was recurrent tumor. And when they went in, they felt that they really couldn't do a local recision anymore, and they had to do a hindquarter amputation in this particular patient. So the, the point I, I, I kind of want to make here is that if you follow patient, if, one, if you give contrast, you have to have at least a T1 fat suppressed pre uh, in, this, in the same plane that you have a fat suppressed post to look for contrast enhancement. And number two, you should follow patients using the exact same sequences in the exact same planes and not change it. Otherwise, you, you don't have apples to apples to compare. I'm sure they would have picked this recurrent tumor up years earlier if they had had the same sequences that they compare the two. And... Uh, and when you're doing surgery, make sure you've got a wide excision on these. They, they, they say that they're slow growing, but uh, but they do grow. Yeah. Okay, well, why don't we stop here today, and we'll pick up looking at fibrous lesions on Thursday. Okay. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. As well.